Welcome again to our lectures on language theory. This is the third lecture within the course uh, in the first module, Theoretical Phonetics. The lecture is being delivered specially for the students whose specialty is foreign language to foreign languages, starting at the Department of English and German Languages. The theme of this lecture is Classification of English Speech Sounds, the system of vowel phonemes in English. The outline of this lecture includes the following points. The main criteria of the articulatory and acoustic classification of speech sounds, in a national phonetic alphabet, and the articulatory classification of English vowels. Soviet and Russian phoneticians, for instance Leontieva, draws our attention to the fact that articulatory differences between vowels, consonants, and sonorants depend on the following criteria. The presence or absence of the articulatory obstruction to the airstream in the larynx or in the supraglottal cavities. The concentrated or diffused character of muscular tension and the force of exhalation. On the basis of this criteria, Consonants may be defined as sounds in the production of which there is an articulated obstruction to the airstream, complete or incomplete, muscular tension is concentrated in the place of obstruction, and the force of exhalation is rather strong. Vowels may be defined as sounds in the production of which there is no articulated obstruction to the airstream, muscular tension is diffused, and the force of exhalation is rather weak. Sonorants are sounds intermediate between noise consonants and vowels because they have features common to both. The abstraction is complete or incomplete, but narrow enough to produce noise. Muscular tension is concentrated in the place of abstraction, but the force of exhalation is rather weak. English sonorants are m, n, n, l, w, r, y. Cambridge phoneticians, like Peter Roach, for instance, define sounds in a different way. They look at the different contexts and positions in which particular sounds can occur. This is the study of the distribution of sounds and is of great importance in phonology. Study of the sounds found at the beginning and end of English words has shown that two groups of sounds with quite different patterns of distribution can be identified, and these two groups are those of vowel and consonant. If we look at the vowel-consonant distinction in this way, we must see that the most important difference between vowel and consonant is not the way they are made, but their different distributions. It is important to remember that the distribution of vowels and consonants is different for each language. Now you will get acquainted with the notion of IPA. To describe speech sounds, phoneticians use the Interna International Phonetic Alphabet, or the abbreviated form is IPA. It aims to provide a separate symbol for every sound used distinctively in a human language. Using symbols from the IPA, we should be able to represent the pronunciation of any word or phrase in any human language. The IPA has grown and evolved over more than a century of international collaboration, with new sounds being added when new sounds, new symbols being added when new sounds turned up in languages. Here you can see the general scheme of the International Phonetic Alphabet for the English language. And here you can see in more detail the IPA symbols with the word examples for the short vowels, such as e, e, a, u, o, e, and 
the IPA symbols and their word examples for the diphthong vowels. And now we'll speak in more detail about the articulatory classification of English vowels. The first linguist who tried to describe and classify vowels for all languages was Jones. He invented the system of eight cardinal vowels on the physiological basis. It is supposed to be an international standard set of vowel sounds chosen to form a scale of reference. According to Jones, they can be produced with the bulk of the tongue at the four cardinal points in the front part of the mouth cavity and at the four cardinal points in the back part of the mouth cavity. But in spite of the theoretical significance of the cardinal vowel system, its practical application is rather limited. Russian phoneticians suggested their own classification of their vowels, and their classification is rather detailed. They classify English vowels according to the following principles. Position of the lips, position of the tongue, length, degree of tenseness, and the character of the end, stability of articulation. According to the position of the lips, English vowels are classified into rounded, labialized, such as u, u, o, o, and unrounded or non-labialized. Rounded vowels are produced when the lips are more or less rounded and slightly protruded. Unrounded vowels are produced when the lips are spread or neutral. The main effects of lip rounding are to enlarge the mouth cavity and to diminish the size of the opening of the mouth cavity. Both of these deepen the pitch. According to the position of the tongue, it is the bulk of the tongue that is the most important in the production of vowels. It can move forward and backward. It can be raised and lowered in the mouth cavity. So, phoneticians divide vowels according to the horizontal and vertical movements of the tongue. According to the horizontal movements of the tongue, vowels are subdivided into back, when the bulk of the tongue is in the back part of the mouth, while the back of the tongue is raised in the direction of the soft palate. Back advanced, when the back part of the tongue is raised highest towards the soft palate. Front, when the bulk of the tongue is in the front part of the mouth, while the front of the tongue is raised in the direction of the hard palate. Front retracted, when the front part of the tongue is raised highest towards the hard palate. And central, when the tongue is almost flat and its central part is raised towards the juncture between the hard and soft palate. According to the vertical movements of the tongue, English vowels are subdivided into high, close, mid-open, half-open, mid, and low or open. High, close vowels are produced when one of the parts of the tongue comes close to the roof of the mouth and the air passage is narrowed, but not so much as to form a consonant. Low or open vowels are produced when the raised part of the tongue is very low in the mouth and the air passage is very wide. Mid-open vowels are produced when the raised part of the tongue is halfway between its high and low positions. Each of the subclasses is subdivided into vowels of narrow variation and vowels of broad variation. According to the length English vowels are subdivided into historically long and historically short. Vowel length may depend on a number of linguistic factors. Position of the vowel in a word. In the terminal position, a vowel is the longest. It shortens before a voiced consonant and it is the shortest before a voiceless consonant. For example, be, beat, beat. Word stress. A vowel is longer in a stressed syllable than in an unstressed syllable. The number of syllables in a word, for instance, er in verse is longer than in university. Verse, university. The character of the syllabic structure. 
Besides, vowel length depends on the tempo of speech. The higher the rate of speech, the shorter the vowels. According to the degree of tenseness, traditionally long vowels are defined as tense when the muscles of the lips, tongue, cheeks, and the back walls of the pharynx are tense, and short vowels are defined as lax when these organs are relatively relaxed. English vowels can be checked and unchecked according to the character of their end. The checked vowels are those which occur in stressed closed syllables, ending in a fortist voiceless consonant. For example, e in bet. These vowels are pronounced without any lessening in the force of utterance towards their end. They are abruptly interrupted by the following voiceless consonant, and they can only occur in a closed syllable. The unchecked vowels are those which are pronounced with lessening the force of utterance towards the end. Therefore, they have weak end and occur terminally or are followed by a lenis voiced consonant. For example, E in B, R in card. According to the stability of articulation, English vowels are subdivided into monothongs, simple vowels, and dithongs, or complex vowels, by Russian phoneticians. English monothongs are pronounced with more or less stable lip, tongue, and mouth walls position. The organs of speech do not perceptibly change their position throughout the duration of the vowel. They are e, 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 o, u, a, e, a, o, e. Dithongs consist of two vowel elements pronounced so as to form a single syllable. In their pronunciation, the organs of speech start in the position of one vowel and glide gradually in the direction of another vowel, whose full formation is generally not accomplished. The first element of an English dithong is called the nucleus. It is strong, clear, and distinct. The second element is rather weak. It is called the glide. English dithongs are a, i, oi, ow, o, ear, air, ur. Besides these dithongs, there are two vowels in English, e and u, which may have a diphongal pronunciation. In the articulation of these vowels, the organs of speech change their position but very slightly. These vowels are called dithongoids. According to Leontiva, dithongs are defined differently by different authors. One definition is based on the ability of a vowel to form a syllable. Another definition of a diphong as a single sound is based on the instability of the second element. Some scientists define a dithong from the existential point of view. Jones defines dithongs as unisyllabic sounds in the articulation of which organs of speech change their position. Trubitskoy also defines dithongs as unisyllabic and states that the part of a diphong cannot belong to two syllables. Zinder adds that phonemically dithongs are sounds that cannot be divided morphologically. The classification of English vowels suggested by Russian scientists is more exact from the articulatory point of view and more simple for teaching purposes. That is all in brief concerning this broad topic. And as a rule, you are offered a set of comprehension questions. At the end of the lecture, you are given, uh, you are provided a list of resources for your further reading. Thank you for attention.